Hello, I am Yukakaya, and this video is a reopening of Plato's Atlantis, including spiritual and supernatural aspects and ample visual evidence of this legendary island. Now, who is Poseidon, also called Neptune, from Latin Neptunus, the founder of Atlantis? The more we know about him, his capabilities and motives, the easier it becomes to identify Atlantis and understand the discoveries made there. In the story of Atlantis and in Greek mythology, Poseidon is called a god. Plato's dialogues also tell that this immortal, non-human being receives for his share the island of Atlantis, falls in love with a young, human and mortal woman, Plato, the daughter of Eveno and Leucippe, begets five pairs of male twins, divides the island into ten parts and makes his sons, who obviously are hybrid beings, as the rulers of Atlantis. Additionally, it is Poseidon himself who helps with the advancement of his island kingdom by extensive landscaping and making special arrangements for water and food supply. An important point here to note is, a big part of the story of Atlantis consists of elements which to us are supernatural, and this fact should not be automatically ignored or excluded when searching for and identifying Atlantis, but rather one should be open-minded for possible extraordinary and surprising discoveries. Now, it appears that there is also a deep spiritual aspect to the story. The description of Poseidon with his actions looks strikingly similar to the occurrence found in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6. This chapter reports about a supernatural, world-changing event, the incursion of the sons of God into our world. The first four verses read as follows. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. This Genesis text is very often interpreted as just dealing with the lines of Seth and Cain, thus giving it an ordinary explanation. However, the Bible clearly confirms that the text is talking about fallen angels. In Jude chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And Second Peter 2, verses 4 to 5 say, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. To briefly describe this Genesis chapter 6, we have these mighty, celestial, and interdimensional spirit beings fallen angels coming into our physical world and taking wives of all which they choose, begetting hybrid offspring, the Nephilim, thus corrupting and spoiling the human genome. The world becomes full of wickedness and violence and all flesh, including the animals, becomes genetically corrupt and consequently God destroys the entire earth by flood, save Noah, his family and the animals on the ark. The fallen angels had the know-how and technology beyond our imagination and were highly motivated to spoil the genomes, not least because of an early prophecy found in Genesis 3.15. Here God tells the serpent after the fall of man, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. To interpret this from the devil's perspective would be like, if there is no uncorrupted woman's offspring, there will be no bruising of the serpent's head. With this background information, one can see the old world through different eyes. 
There exist thousands upon thousands of ancient depictions and accounts of hybrid beings, like this chimera, for instance. It has the body of a lion, a goat's head protruding from it, which could breed fire, and a snake or dragon-like tail. This creature has the words genetic tampering written all over it, but it is usually put into the category of myths of fantasy, since many believe that no such technology existed back then. Later, I will be showing visual evidence which clearly demonstrates that the antediluvian world had access to basically any advanced technology that they desired. From Plato's dialogues we learned that it was Solon, an Athenian statesman, lawmaker and poet, who brought the account of Atlantis to Greece from his travels in Egypt. Solon lived from circa 630 to circa 560 BC, predating Plato by about 200 years. He learned about Atlantis from Egyptian priests in the temple of Neith in Sais. Today there's hardly anything left of that temple. There seems to be an Egypt-Atlantis connection. Here are two places in Egypt which are relevant to this video. Besides Sais, where the Atlantis story was preserved according to Plato, there's the city of Abydos and the temple of Seti I, where there's an interesting carving depicting what appear to be advanced types of vehicles. Now, this is explained away to be the result of overlapping hieroglyphs and erosion, so basically what appears to be modern technology is said to be just a coincidence. Everyone can decide for themselves. This carving will be shown once more in conjunction with the designed lake in Atlantis for comparison, which truly should be interesting. Here is some information from Plato's dialogues about Atlantis. The first sentence gives us the location and the size. There was an island opposite the strait which you call, so you say, the Pillars of Heracles, an island larger than Libya and Asia combined. Let's have a look at Athanasius Kircher's map of Atlantis. Kircher was a German Jesuit scholar who lived from 1602 to 1680. The Latin text on the upper left corner says, Site of the island of Atlantis, once swallowed up by the sea according to the beliefs of the Egyptians and Plato's description. On this map, south is up and north is down. So down left where it says Hispania, that is the Iberian Peninsula, and between it and Africa we have the Strait of Gibraltar with the Pillars of Heracles. America is depicted on the very right. Besides the location in the Atlantic Ocean, very noteworthy here is also the enormous size of the island of Atlantis when comparing it, for instance, with the Iberian Peninsula. About the destruction of Atlantis, Plato writes, At a later time there were earthquakes and floods of extraordinary violence, and in a single dreadful day and night all your fighting men were swallowed up by the earth, and the island of Atlantis was similarly swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Here Kircher's depiction of Atlantis is turned upside down and inserted onto today's globe. One has to keep in mind that if a mountainous island of this size disappears, it is because of a global, world-changing, massive cataclysm, something which we have never seen in our lifetime. So we have this enormous island opposite of the Strait of Gibraltar, which vanishes in a single dreadful day and night. Since there is no trace of a huge sunken island at this location, one has to ask if there is an alternative to vanishing due to sinking at this very spot. And the answer is yes. The alternative is vanishing due to relocation of the island with its own tectonic plate which is triggered by a huge impact on the planet's stability, something like a sudden axis tilt. The ancient, apocryphal book of Noah, which is included in the book of Enoch, has intriguing details regarding this. In the M.A. Nibs translation it reads, 
and in those days Noah saw the earth had tilted, and that its destruction was near. Another translation by R. H. Charles uses the words, The earth had sunk. Here we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It is, for the most part, an underwater mountain range, extending all the way from the Arctic Ocean to the Bouvet Triple Junction, where the South American, the African and the Antarctic plates meet. The ridge is extremely long, about 20,000 kilometers, a boundary between many major tectonic plates. Tectonic plates are in a constant slow movement, normally a few centimeters a year floating around like gigantic rafts on the Earth's mantle. At the boundaries, tectonic stress often builds up and results in earthquakes. The question is, was the island of Atlantis with its own tectonic plate approximately here, where today we have the Azores Triple Junction, a meeting point of three major plates? And was this mid-Atlantic ridge the Atlantis path of destruction? a long slide between these continents, which ended up on the South Pole. A cold grave. It looks like it. This may sound wild or impossible to some, but it is likelier than a huge island like this just vanishing into thin air. And there will be plenty of visual evidence in support of this theory. If this icy continent Antarctica is Atlantis, we should be able to find evidence of a highly advanced ancient civilization and evidence of a former hospitable climate in conjunction with it. The main focus of this part of the video will be on the Bunger Oasis, but to unlock its secrets it is helpful first to have a closer look at the Schirmer Oasis. These two oases are roughly 3000 kilometers apart, but they share similar shoreline constructions. Here is a bay at the Schirmer Oasis which is entirely equipped with, which I call the Antarctic Seawall. This is a Google Earth image and of this area we also have a photograph taken by the Russian officer, Mr. Gavrikov. One can clearly see that this is not a natural feature. It is planned and built. Shoreline constructions like these are made during a time and for a time when a location is free of ice and are witnesses of a former hospitable climate and an ancient but advanced civilization. Let us move to another part of this oasis. The seawall can be seen everywhere, and there are parts which are not covered by ice. This tribe, which looks as if it were made of concrete, could be of a similar or same type of material as used here in this ice-covered bay, but besides that, stripes like these have apparently been used for multiple purposes, which I will be showing you at the Bunger Oasis. In East Antarctica, at the Bunger Oasis, we find a horizontal sculpture made of an island or islands meant to be viewed only from above, from the air. Colors are added here for clarity. This piece of work, which I call Antarctic Birds, is of an immense size. It is truly huge. The bird on the right alone, that looks like a cormorant facing right, Using Google Earth Ruler measures approximately 5 to 6 kilometers in length. The Bunger Oasis in which these birds are located is not the center city or plain of Atlantis, but here's the similarity to Plato's account. It is about the magnitude and extensiveness of landscape engineering, which simply is unbelievable. In Critias, 
Plato writes about the dimensions of the artificial ditch dug around the plain of Atlantis. The depth and breadth and length of this may sound incredible for an artificial structure when compared with others of a similar kind, but I must give them as I heard them. The depth was a hundred feet, the width at every point a stade, and the length, since it was dug right around the plane, was 10,000 stades. So now using the metric system, the ditch was about 30 meters deep, 185 meters wide, and 1,850 kilometers long. Yet another detail of this massive Earth sculpture reminds us of Atlantis. We know that Atlantis was a maritime power. Here we see a group of three big birds, the cormorant on the right and two penguin-looking birds on the left. They are all seabirds and this piece of art has a marine theme. Now between the two penguin-shaped birds, there seems to be a subtle carved line for distinction. And down here, there is possibly a young bird or birds in a nest, but because of the snow or ice, it is hard to figure it out. The top part of this artwork is very revealing. Here we can see the usage and some of the purposes of the stripes or patches, which look like a type of concrete and which seem to be similar to the patches previously seen on the shoreline of the Shermahe Oasis, the cormorant, which has an eye made of a lake and which is looking to the right, has a crest created and shaped by this material. Additionally, there's a patch going from the top of the head along the beak, repairing the uneven shoreline and thus enhancing the visual impression when viewed from above. The two penguin-looking birds have a similar patch on the top of their heads. So the stripes here have been used for creating, shaping, repairing and enhancing this piece of horizontal sculpture. Here we have a profile of a woman, which I call Young Lady in a Hat. Colors are added for illustration. It is a part of a water body presently covered with ice. There's a connected part further up in this picture, which is ice free. This looks like a very unusual way of finding out something about the fashion on this continent thousands of years ago at the time these shorelines were engineered. The artificial construction can be seen in details like in this, which looks like the rim of the hat. Here's a similar seawall to be found as previously seen at the Shiamaha Oasis. The hat has the length of approximately one kilometer, which is remarkable. The combination of the two accessories, the hat and the choker necklace, gives the profile a modern look. Through this outline, the builders have managed to create and engineer an image which seems accurately to reflect personal style. Here's a more encompassing picture of the surroundings where one can see the white usage of the seawall feature and now the human profile becomes a part of a bigger and very puzzling scenario. This detail remaining as the easiest segment to apprehend. With this profile of the young lady, it looks like we are provided here with a glance of Atlantean fashion. Here's a roughly two kilometers long ice-covered lake with seven islands. It is both designed and engineered. The entire shoreline has been given the seawall finish. It seems to depict an object which looks like a modern vessel. 
I will give here my personal estimation of what the various parts represent. Colors are added. On the top left there is something which looks like an excess hatch. On the right side the circle part looks like a cockpit. And on the bottom right there seems to be an unusual front rudder. The seven roundish spots look like portholes and the undulatory line at the bottom represents waves. The excess hatch and the special positionings of the portholes also give this vessel some submarine character and perhaps it is designed to be used both above and below the water surface. Obviously it is not manually powered but has an unknown power source and the design would fit well into this ancient Egyptian relief. Here are two major areas which both contain several points of interest. On the left we have Bunger Hills which is a part of the Bunger Oasis and the terrain on the upper right corner is called Obruchev Hills. I also call that area the base. Some of the most prominent built structures of the Bunger Hills are pinpointed here. The vessel is located just before the gap between these two hills. And also worth mentioning is this oval structure, which is not far from the vessel. Now before going to Obruchev Hills, another important thing has to be said. It appears that this entire terrain is thoroughly and completely planned and designed even the smallest islands seem to have a seawall around them. Later on I will be showing an occult picture of this whole area, which can give an answer to the question why there has been such a meticulous attention to detail. Here we have an animal shaped lake. It is roughly 3 kilometers both long and wide. The outline of this lake can be drawn by simply following the Antarctic seawall, which is constructed in great detail and care. The head area reminds me of a pig. In this part there are two islands, the smaller upper one is the creature's left eye and the bigger one is possibly a neck ornament. The arms of this animal are wings, especially the larger one has a wing form. We are looking at a hybrid being, here a depiction, but with the technology and know-how they had in their hands, looks like they could easily produce living critters like this. This is a male animal, as can clearly be seen, and there seems to be a strong sexual emphasis in this artwork. The hybrid's legs are very short and it is standing on its two feet. Now this piece of art is designed to be viewed only from the air. Very noteworthy here is how the artists have used perspective. One has to keep in mind that this is an engineered lake, which is about three kilometers wide. The creature's left wing and left ear, which we see on our right side, are considerably bigger than its right counterparts. Close by there is another animal shaped lake, which seems to depict a bird with its beak open. The head part of the animal has the seawall feature, which shows that here is another artwork. Now a lot of it has been damaged by glacial movement on the right, but on the left hand side there is something like a breakwater which seems to form a part of the bird's left wing. The shape of the head is certain, but the colored line drawn for the body is merely a suggestion. The two animal shaped lakes are at this location. The hybrid creature is here. the head of the bird and possibly the left wing over here. 
Additionally, two cave entrances have been found in the pictures of these hills. One is in the proximity of the bird's head, over here. This image of the entrance has been blurred out, so one has to go back in time to the year 2006. This looks like an artificially made cave entrance. Another cave is found roughly 8 kilometers away. And here one can clearly see a metallic looking lid covering a part of the cave entrance with some zigzag lines on the top. This is beyond any doubt designed and constructed. Like in the Bunger Hills, there's a similar oval shaped structure found. Over here. Now as we have seen that these two hilly areas share these massive engineered art constructions which are designed to be viewed from the air, they also share something else and are connected by it. An air route which is more than 70 kilometers long, a straight line between Antarctic birds and the last cave, this is the return route. Now, obviously, an air route has not a road-like construction which can be followed and tracked very easily. However, should the air route have attractions along its way, like many roads have roadside attractions, the figuring out of the air route becomes much easier. And here we have this case. Also, we have learned that at the edges of these elevated areas there are similar oval shaped structures. The one in the Bunger Hills seems to stand by itself, whereas the one in Obrochev Hills could be a part of the artwork. The distance between these two is about 33 kilometers. Now whether these two similar structures are also some kind of orientation marks is unclear. However, including them in the straight line from the birds to the last cave results in a suitable air route. I will go through this flight path step by step, approaching the continent with its islands from the ocean side. This is the return route where crafts flew back to their home base. It looks like most attractions along this route are constructed to be viewed on the return flight. Now when talking about crafts, we are talking about advanced aviation, where apparently round-shaped flying devices can directly fly into the underground hangar. Years ago on Google Earth images, there was an anomaly found only about 15 kilometers away from the air route. The object seems to have a disc shape, of which we see about a half. It looks like it is under a ledge. Additionally, the object seems to possess a rim which is of a lighter color and there appears to be some sign or pattern on the top. It has the looks and the design to be used on this route and this anomaly should be objectively investigated. So, coming from the ocean in a craft, you first see this landmark, which is the entrance to these hills. The main carved island where the birds are is approximately 10 to 11 kilometers long, a huge artwork. This image is rather colorless, so here is a colored version.
After passing the monumental entrance sculpture, the next point of interest is this intriguing scenario with the human head on the left. Then we arrive at this oval structure, which is close to the edge of these hills. To this vessel over here, I will come back later. We cross this roughly 30 kilometers long gap and arrive at the next oval structure. And the hybrid creature. Here the red line goes between the ears of the animal. Not far is what looks like the left wing belonging to this bird. And here is the first cave on the right hand side coming from this direction. It is visible on the 2006 image. We follow the red line till the end and arrive in front of the last engineered cave. Now we turn to what actually is the outbound flight. There is this one point of interest, the vessel, which is positioned perfectly when coming from this side and flying towards the ocean. Very noteworthy is that the lake is located a few kilometers away from the red line on this side, which can be an indication that they had right-hand air traffic on this particular flight route. The lake depicts advanced maritime technology, and what makes this even more impressive is that it seems to have been built high up directly on the edge of a cliff. Here on the left hand side one can see hill ridges with grooves on the side, and what we see up here is this very thick seawall, roughly 50 meters thick, built in a waveform likely to represent waves, and directly beneath it we see these vertical grooves all the way down to here. At this point one can imagine flying in a disc-shaped craft towards the ocean, seeing a constructed lake depicting state-of-the-art technology, positioned high up on a cliff, the water having perhaps blue color like here. This is not science fiction, this used to be a part of certain type of activities in Atlantis. Before going here into details, let us go back to Plato and read what Poseidon did. This is about the famous concentric rings of Atlantis. This deity made alternate zones of sea and land, larger and smaller. Encircling one another, there were two of land and three of water, which he turned as with a lathe, each having its circumference equidistant every way from the center. Furthermore, it says that, he himself, being a god, found no difficulty in making special arrangements for the center island, bringing up two springs of water from beneath the earth, one of warm water and the other of cold. So here we have extensive precision landscape engineering combined with the usage of geothermal energy, and all this is done by one single deity, Poseidon. Since it appears that Poseidon was one of the sons of God, described in Genesis chapter 6, let us check in the Bible if one angel would be capable of doing this. Isaiah 37, 36 tells that one angel killed overnight 185,000 Assyrian troops, which shows that angels are extremely powerful beings, so yes, an angel could certainly do this kind of large-scale engineering. Now coming back to this 3D image, 
Noteworthy here are the same two key elements that also played an important part in forming the center city of Atlantis. Extensive precision landscape engineering combined with the usage of geothermal energy. And the 3D effect still works after thousands of years despite Antarctica's present hostile environment. Immense skills are needed to achieve this and trying to reduplicate something like it today would be a major challenge to say the least. Whether Poseidon himself was directly involved in creating this evil looking masterpiece it doesn't say. Possibly. At least it would have been easy for him if we believe Plato's description of his capabilities. In today's world we may not be used to this kind of landscaping, but that doesn't mean that the Atlantis did not have it, or were not able to see and view it from their crafts for instance. At this point one could wonder what in the world was going on in Atlantis. They had apparent flying saucer activities and now we are looking at this huge three-dimensional occult artwork depicting a demonic entity that is holding a gadget in its fingers. About the gadget there seems to be a hovering object. To many this may appear very strange and it needs an explanation. This seems to be about spiritual warfare, about worship and deception, and the lessons one could learn from this occult picture are just because some entities show up with superior, mind-blowing technology does not mean that they are gods or that they should be worshipped or that they originate from outer space. Considering the entire visual evidence found in Antarctica, it looks like not only were the dwellers of Atlantis capable of constructing astonishing flying devices, but also they were able to genetically engineer the matching flight crew to go with their crafts, beings which we today would call alien greys, for instance, or any other kind of creatures, like this one in the picture, which appears to have some human, some animal DNA, and who knows what else. Plato writes in Critias about how the gods, this would also include Poseidon, made for themselves temples and instituted sacrifices. This shows how important it was for these deities to have people worshipping them, they demanded it. And long after they were gone, temples were still built for them like this Poseidon temple at Capsonian in Greece, built circa 440 BC. From the Bible we understand that the angels, which did not keep their first estate, are now in everlasting change under darkness under the judgment of the great day. There is a very accurate explanation about how Satan and his evil ones are the creators of the space aliens. It is from the year 1990 in the prophecies given to Raymond Aguilera. These prophecies are from God, and I don't say this lightly. As there is visual evidence of Atlantis in Antarctica, there is visual evidence of these prophecies being from God in the Eagle Nebula. In an excerpt of the prophecy 868, we read, Ray. I ask you about aliens from other worlds. Are there any living things in other planets, in other worlds, besides the Earth? Where Jesus replies, Like I told you earlier, the evil things you see in the sky that move so fast are from Satan. Satan and his evil ones are the creators of the space aliens. For the Lord, the great I Am, created only man in his image, but man was spoiled by Satan. Satan has dominion over the Earth. But after the war he will be in shackles, in hell, until he is released for the final battle. He created the space creatures so people would chase them and treat them as gods. He wants people to treat the aliens as gods because they are satanic beings. It is another one of his tricks to fool the stupid and the blind. Woe to man who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Great I Am, and the Holy Spirit. Also in the prophecy 1073 from the year 1997, the Lord tells us to look to inner space instead of outer space, because that's where the spirit demons and the devil are. The Lord said, The media, the movie makers are going to want you to look to outer space for other beings, they call them aliens. What I am telling you is, do not look to outer space, look to inner space, for that is where they are, the spirit demons, the things that are not of God, the things that will destroy you. 
So look to the Bible, look to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, look to the Father. Through the power, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, you will find heaven. Listen to my words clearly and to the point. Inner space, inner space, inner space is where the devil is. So be it, so be it, so be it. It looks like the story of Atlantis has a very prominent spiritual background and it is a story about one of the sons of God, a fallen angel on earth called Poseidon. He used his power and knowledge knowing the secrets of heaven to raise his island of Atlantis to an incredibly high technological level. Being a rebel who had abandoned his proper dwelling in heaven, he was siding with the devil. His Atlantis, which was entirely ruled and controlled by his preferred hybrid race, was obviously tampering with the creation and producing any hybrid creatures one could think of. He wanted to be worshipped as a god, and this was apparently not enough because his technologically advanced island was helping the devil to further deceive people to worship the evil. This was, and still is, a spiritual battle. The island of Atlantis landed on the coldest spot on the planet through a massive cataclysm, and Poseidon, as it appears, was cast down to Tartarus, where he's waiting for his final judgment.